Good afternoon. I'm coming to you remotely from San Jose, California. I couldn't make it down to San Diego this time around, and I apologize for that, but I'm really thrilled that we were able to accommodate myself and Danel Moon to be able to bring you guys this collaboration that we came up with. What I want to talk to you about is the pedagogical side of do, working with special collections in the library and the undergraduate classroom. In my recent tenure dossier to my university's administrators at conferences and coffee meetings, over lunch, across Twitter, in webinars, within the day in the life of a digital humanist, and in an occasional article, I've been discussing the efficacy of bringing students into digital humanities. I've accomplished this somewhat by inviting them to use digital tools to collaborate on assignments or to simply expose their ideas by posting to class public forums. I've moved beyond PowerPoint in the classroom, not because PowerPoint is an inadequate tool, but because we have other ways of generating and demonstrating students' mastery of information and knowledge these days. Of course, inherent to all of these pedagogical experiments is a sense of what I would like to call productive failure for both me and my students. The difference, of course, is that when I fail in an experiment, I often give extra points to overcome the shock of failure for the students because they hate that. All of this falls under the catchphrase of student-centered learning. What we would like students to become are lifelong learners. Does this type of classroom activity and these kinds of ins assignments inspire them to be lifelong learners, this idea of digital humanities? In a 2010 talk titled, The Hermeneutics of Screwing Around, Stephen Ramsey declares that for most scholars, browsing the stacks in a library involves a sense of exploration, even willing playfulness. What Ramsey addresses here is a seemingly disorganized conglomeration of information, things that scholars find fascinating, engaging, cool even, stuff that may not be publishable according to current standards for scholarship, data that inevitably needs to be shared in order to be relevant. In other words, the enthusiasm created by scholarly discoveries is made public through such social networking uh, venues as Ramsey talks about in this particular talk. For Ramsey, being an academic promises even requires unbounded playing and learning in order to achieve cultural literacy. In other words, screwing around. For him, this is the foundation of digital humanities along with a few other mainstays. For me, it's this chart. It becomes the screwmanutical imperative which was written about by Julie Maloney when she was discussing teaching her humanities students how to code. She had to let them go and play around before they could figure out why coding was important. This leads to students screwing around. Now we do this and this is the passion that we bring to the work that we bear in any venue whether it's a, a literary scholar or in a library or in special collections. This leads to a sense of playfulness and now playfulness has a sense of rules to it and possibly an outcome and that's why it's a little bit different than just screwing around. From there we build things and I don't mean we build websites or databases but we build access to knowledge and in that way we offer learning in new ways for our students and they actually have a lot of fun doing these kinds of things. Now these are the mainstays of digital humanities and the ones that I go by. Tinkering, which is part of playing around and screwing around. Collaboration, building, and then the one in dark blue down at the bottom that you probably can't make out is process, identifying and marking process to be as important as the outcome. Collaboration is the linchpin to supporting all of this productivity, learning, experimenting, and knowledge acquisition. The unwritten goal, this unwritten goal was reinforced by a few tech industry magnets at Stanford's Bibliotech Symposium last year. The CEOs want liberal arts and humanities doctoral students who can command language, interpret technical jargon into metaphor and narrative, and work collaboratively in team situations. Humanity scholars often think of themselves as the lonely bibliophiles in the library stacks, quietly slaving over monographs. But digital humanities has altered that paradigm, even required that humanists consider exposing their collaborative work even if it isn't digitally inclined. Now, I want to invert that a little bit and propose that undergraduate and master's students can offer intriguing, if not altogether unique, perspectives to work in digital humanities, beyond the limitations of classroom-specific assignments. That lifelong learning that could translate so well to economic or employment success. That's just one thing that we're having to deal with in California now, just justifying what we're doing in the humanities, but it's not the end-all.
Now I encourage students to play around with their final projects and I encourage them to use different medium platforms but this means they take a risk and in order to allow your students to take a risk you have to be willing to back them up. And this is what Kathleen Fitzpatrick talks about um, at the MLA, that in order to have risk, you have to have some sort of senior person who's willing to say that it's okay to take those risks. And you set up boundaries and rules for them. So my students, through screwing around, have done several things. Static hypertexts, video mashups, one of which was called Prometheus Smurf. It was hilarious blogs, one of which was about Frankenstein's creature. Uh, it was a blog to get his voice, and since the creature learned French first, the student blogged in both French and English. And then we also have creations of e-literature, where students explore uh, a more creative writing style in order to understand the, the imposition of technology on writing. And then finally, there were students who created games in Extra Normal, and that's a whole nother ball of wax. I'd like to be able to show you what some of these students have done, but more importantly, I want to get to what we were here to talk about for today. I'm going to ask Danell to play a video from Ray Humanities, and then we'll come and then we'll come back to talking about these other things that I wanted to say. It affirms the idea of a liberal arts classroom in the sense that you're working off the idea that people are collaborating on an intimate level and that sort of, that collaboration and intimacy needs to be recognized. When you're doing research um, that you have some control over and that isn't just for, you know, it has meaning outside of the classroom to yourself that there is a greater sense of ownership and also intellectual empowerment. When they're recording equipment, they sit down with, with local language activists and people in the community, usually the elders who know the language really well, and just say, well, we have a list of like a thousand words. Usually we have a purpose all the time, um, always have a thesis and And we're back. So what we've done is taken those ideas about undergraduates from Ray Humanities style uh, conference and we've added it to a digital project that I that was eventually deemed the Beard Stare Project. The, or rather this is instead what four really intrepid, interested, passionate graduate and undergraduate students decided to do. They took and went and did the risky thing. In the fall of 2011, we did something so radical that a group of us decided to grow a project completely outside the parameters of my English department, but with the within the boundaries of our university. A project that engages digital humanities, literary criticism, print culture, history of the book, library science, visual and creative arts, bibliographical descriptions, and well, just plain fun, and included some food. That project is this one, the Beard Stare Project, which you're going to be able to visit in just a minute. From this small intervention of the project was born uh, with the students and myself, we designed an experiment focused on the art of the book, an analysis of the literary content, structure, and artistry of the paper, woodcut illustrations, digitization of the books for discovery and access, curation of a physical and digital exhibit, and potential disposition of the artifacts to special collections. Uh, what follows uh, is a video that details Pollyanna Macchiano, one of the undergraduate students who has since graduated, talking about what it is to create the Beard Stair project, project from their point of view. So, Danelle, if you want to go to the next video. She take on these tasks, tasks, and the last project, the most exciting for me, um, is the Beard Stair project, and Beard Stair is kind of a a conjoined word from Beardsley, the artist, and Alistair, the other artist. Um, 
And this project is a digital edition project that um, me and three other students are endeavoring to take on. And um, we have these rare books, and um, these were actually donated to the library anonymously. And they're very rare. Um, only maybe three exist of tier three poem that we have. And um, Dr. Harris um, asked me and a few other students if we wanted to be involved with this because it wasn't officially a part of the library system. It was um, basically just three random, really rare, really awesome books that came into the hands of my friend who worked at the library. And so we decided to take on this. And so we're doing independent research. We are um, making steps to making a digital edition, which is why I attended the Omeka workshop and um, will attend PEI. Um, and the reason why I'm involved in this is because I have a really great interest in um, late 19th century literature and art. And the second period um, actually appeals to me. And so it's this interest in the topic that pushed me like really hard to make research happen. And I've been researching ever since um, the start of this exposed movie during the summer. And um, we hope to have an actual exhibit at Special Collections in our library. Um, was it this semester or next semester? This semester. <laughs> <laughs> and um, so we hopefully will get through, and I think we will, because we're all really interested in the project. And I guess it's that kind of drive, that, that interest level, that will make things happen. And I think that is one of the things I learned um, through doing this. And if I can show you a blog that I made. The Beard Stare project relies on a team-based learning and collaboration among the students. I and myself and Special Collections, more specifically with, with Danell. The project methodology is designed to expedite student knowledge drawing from digital humanities tools and to model building a project or team-centered product that infuses students with real-life skills and this idea of lifelong learning that are marketable in real-life work environments. And I know this to be true because Pollyanna has since gotten a job at a local major technology firm and Jesus, the one of the other ones, has also since gotten a job at the Library of Congress or an internship. The Beardstar Project is a small experimental pilot that illustrates the value of diverse collaboration, diverse approaches to teaching and pedagogy, interaction with physical and digital humanities resources, and the role that special collections and archival programs can play in supporting the growth of digital humanities study, research, and scholarship. This is one of the books that we found. It's The Sphinx by Oscar Wilde, and it's illustrated and decorated by Alistair. As you can see from Pollyanna's images that were shown before, it's such an incredible book that's very decadent in terms of the engravings, but the students didn't want to stop there. They wanted to read and reread and use their close reading and literary critical skills as well as their art history skills, and they acquired bibliographical skills in order to be able to describe each book. This is the second book, Illustrations by Aubrey Beardsley for The Ballad of the Barber. And there was also a fourth book that we decided not to use on William Blake because they thought there was too much already on him. We determined a two-fold approach to the project. The fall semester goals included an exhibit in special collections and research time to figure out the connections and context. And in the spring semester, the goals included constructing a digital edition supported and maintained by the library and to be peer reviewed by nines, if at all possible. My goal was really to create a digital scholarly edition that would become a resource for scholars. This means that their research and writing would have to match scholarly requirements, which would be very difficult. It also means that we need an out-of-the-box platform for demonstrating uh, and displaying a scholarly edition. The closest we could come up with was Omeka with a WordPress plugin, but the team isn't necessarily satisfied with that. And I went to the Digital Humanities Summer Institute and taught digital pedagogy there. And there are quite a few out of the box platforms that will support creating a digital scholarly edition, ones that don't require the students to do any sort of markup in TEI, though we would explore that in later instantiations.
Now, there's some lessons learned that were really great. After describing archival research and the exploratory impetus behind doing this kind of work, the team committed to follow any path or avenue that was compelling. See? Screwing around. And more importantly, they agreed to update each other over our Google group and to exchange books at each meeting. This way, each person would spend four weeks with a single volume. They were committed to going down that rabbit hole. And to tell you the truth, I think this is what drives them, not knowing what question to ask, but knowing that there's more out there to discover. This is most definitely Derrida's archive fever written all over them. Last fall, we met once each month in my tiny apartment where all I can do is encourage and feed them while they chat. I take notes, set goals for the month, post interesting relevant links to our Google group, look for funding, and send out reminders for the next meeting. I'm the project manager. They are the scholars. Indeed, they are the experts. Each month, I kept expecting someone to fall away or become overwhelmed with the work because they're all taking a full course load and then some. But each month, they return energized about their discovery and inspired each other to dig deeper into histories. They've recently decided that they will no longer consult other researchers and scholars, but they would like to maintain the sanctity of the group and write this material themselves. They don't want to be scooped. I don't know about you, but that sounds like scholars to me. There's a, but there's a hitch with this incredible project-centered pseudo-course. No one is getting credit for it, and it became too complicated to involve the San Jose State Administration and various disciplines. We would have to request independent study for everyone, and with the budget crunch, my department frowns on that solution. Additionally, independent study shows up on their transcripts un under the associate chair, not me. Consequently, it didn't really make sense, and none of them needed the credit, plus it would cost them more money. Quite frankly, this frees me from assessing their work, because assessing digital projects requires a different framework than assessing coursework. I'm not focusing on the outcome, the product. Instead, we are engaged in a process, one that will take over a year to come to fruition. They consider this project and our meetings their fun time. Fun time! So we gather, talk, eat, sometimes drink, touch books, exchange stories, make progress, ask questions, laugh, celebrate, but mostly we collaborate. No, no, let me correct that. They collaborate. There's an undertone here that a collaboration without the benefit of the library and one of our uh, School of Library and Information Science students wouldn't offer as fulfilling and complete an experience for these students. But more importantly, the project wouldn't represent professional standards in both library science and literary studies. Beardster has completely stopped now. That's one of the pitfalls. We're outside the university curriculum. In other words, I've been sneaking in digital projects for years at San Jose State into my courses. Now, after experimenting with what I really want to do with students, I can see the severe pitfalls, even of doing this inside of a curriculum. In spring 2013, I'm teaching Dickens in the Digital Age, which was just approved by my English department, where I'll implement what I've learned from the Beardstar project and apply my experience with project management to have students create digital editions of the Dickens serials in San Jose State's special collections. And I can't remember if I told Danelle this or not. If she looks surprised, then I didn't tell her. Because my background is in archival research, textual studies, and digital humanities, I've been able to steer the graduate students and undergraduate students in, at Beardstare towards a critical view of such things as metadata, image acquisition, and sustainability, in addition to helping them develop their skills as literary historians, researchers, and project managers. Though the students, Will, receive, will, will not receive any course credit for entangling ourselves in such a project, the students experience a glimpse of inter- even post-disciplinary collaboration. They also come to understand the benefits of library and information sciences across disciplinary boundaries. In fact, I'm not teaching those boundaries. We're not even talking about disciplines. In fact, they ask questions. You or I answer them uh, without limiting the knowledge to a particular field. You and I as Danelle and I. <laughs> what if we erase those intellectual boundaries in collaborating with rare book and special collections? What if we teach curiosity, playfulness, inquiry to our students? We might see them in our rare book rooms more often where they can touch the stuff and smell all those great books. Thank you, and I appreciate the chance to come to you <laughs> via video here, and I hope you got something out of it. I'm going to try to join you on Skype for the Q&A, but let's see if we get that done.